Chapter 4 After the judge ordered him to nickel, Elwood had three last nights at home. The state car arrived at 7 o'clock Tuesday morning. The officer of the court was a good old boy with a meaty backwoods beard and a hungover wobble to his step. He had grown his shirt and the pressure against the buttons made him look upholstered. But he was a light man with a pistol, so despite his dishevelment, he sent a vibration. Along the street, men watched from porches and smoked and gripped the railings as if afraid of falling overboard. The neighbors peeked through their windows for a view, connecting the scene to events from years before, when a boy or a man was taken away, and he was not someone who lived across the street, but Ken, brother, son. The officer tossed a toothpick around in his mouth when he talked, which was not often. He handcuffed Elwood to a metal bar, then ran behind the front seat and didn't speak for 275 miles. They got down to Tampa, and five minutes later, the officer was in a fight with a clerk at the jail. There had been a mistake. All three boys were headed for Nickel Academy, and the colored boy was supposed to be picked up last, not first. Tallahassee was only a far or an hour away from the school, after all. Didn't he think it strange that he was driving the boy up and down the street like a yo-yo, the clerk asked. At this point, his face was red. I just read what's on the paper, the officer said. It's alphabetical, the clerk said. Elwood rubbed at the mark of the cuffs cut into his wrists. The console on the bench in the waiting room was a church pew. It was the same shape. Half an hour later, they were on the road again. Franklin T. and Bill Y. alphabetically distant and temperamentally even farther. Elwood took the two white boys next to him, who were rough characters from the first scout. Franklin T. had the most freckled face he had ever seen, with a deep sun tan and cream cut red hair. He had a downcast look, head sunk staring at his toes, but when he lifted his eyes to other people, they were invariably wrestled with fury. Bill Y's eyes, for their part, had been punched black, purple, and lurid. His lips were puffed and scrapped and scabbed. The brown pear-shaped birthmark on his right cheek added another hue to his mottled face. He snorted when he got a look at Elwood. Whenever their legs touched on the drive, Bill pulled back as he leaned against a hot chimney stove. Whatever their life stories were, what have they done to get sent to Nickel? The boys were chained together in the same fashion and headed to the same destination. Franklin and Bill exchanged notes for a, after a while. This was Franklin's second visit to Nickel. The first time was being recalcitrant. He was back for a Tron scene. He got looking for eyeballing the wife of one of the house fathers. But other than that, the place was decent, he supposed. Anyway, for a stepfather at least. Bill was raised by his sister and fell in with a bunch of bad apples, as the judge put it. They broke the front window of a pharmacy, but Bill got off easy. He scored a nickel because he was only 14, while the rest were heading up to Panama. The officer told the white boys that they were sitting with a car thief, and Bill laughed. Oh, I used to go joyriding all the time, they said. They should have pinched me for that, not some dumb window. Outside of Gainesville, they drifted off the interstate. The officer pulled over to let everyone piss and gave them mustard sandwiches. He then cuffed them when they got back in the car. The officer said he knew they weren't going to run. He skirted Tallahassee, taking the back road around it like the place didn't exist anymore. I didn't even recognize the trees, Edward told himself when they got to Jackson County, feeling low. He got a look at the school and thought maybe Franklin was right. Nickel wasn't that bad. He expected tall stone walls and barbed wire, but there were no walls at all. The campus was kept meticulously, a bounty of lush green dot with two and three storied buildings of red brick, with cedar creeks, trees, and beaches. Cut out portions of shade, tall and ancient. It was the nicest looking for property Elwood had ever seen, a real school, a good one, not the forbidden reformatory he conjured the last few weeks. In a sad joke, it intersected with the visions of Melvin Griggs Technical, minus a few statues and columns. They drove up the long road to the main administration building, and Elwood caught sign of a football field where some boys committed and yelped. In his head, he seen kids attached to balls and change, chains, something out of cartoons. But those fellows were having a swell time out there, thundering around the gla- grass. All right, Bill said, please. Elwood was not the only one reassured. The officer said, don't get smart. If the housemen don't run you down and the swamp don't suck you up, they call in those dogs from the state penitentiary. Appalachian, Franklin said. You get along and you'll get along, the officer said. Inside the building, the officer waved down a secretary who took them into a yellow room whose walls were lined with wooden filing cabinets. 
The chairs were in classroom rows, and the boys picked spots far away from one another. Elwood took a place in the front. Per his custom, they all sat up when Superintendent Spencer knocked the door open. Maynard Spencer was a white man in his late fifties. He was silver in his cropped black hair, a real crack of dawn, as Harriet used to say, who moved in a deliberate, deliberate air as if he rehearsed everything in front of a mirror. He had a narrow raccoon face that drew Elwood's attention to his tiny nose and dark circle, circles under his eyes and thick, bristly eyebrows. Spencer was a fastidious with his dark green nickel uniform. Every crease in his clothes looked sharp enough to cut, as if he was a, he were a living blade. Spencer nodded at Franklin, who grabbed the corners of his desk. The, the supervisor suppressed a smile as if he'd known the boy would be back. He leaned against the blackboard and crossed his arms. You got here late in the day, he said, so I won't go on too long. Everybody's here because they haven't figured out how to be around just decent people. That's okay. This is a school and we're teachers. We're going to teach you how to do things like everybody else. I know you've heard all this before, Franklin, but it didn't take, obviously. Maybe this time it will. Right now, all of you are grubs. You have four ranks of behavior here. Start as a grub, work your way up to explorer, then pioneer, and then finally ace. Earn merits for your acting rights, and you move on up the ladder. You work on achieving the highest rank of ace, and then you graduate and go home to your families. He paused. If they'll have you, but that's between y'all. And ace, he said, listens to the houseman and his house father. This is work without shirking and, mal and malingering, and applies himself to his studies. An ace does not roughhouse, he does not cuss, he does not blaspheme or, ca or carry on. He works to reform himself from sunrise to sunset. It's up to you how much you spend with us, Spencer said. We don't mess around with idiots here. If you mess up, we have a place for you, and you will not like it. I'll see it to it personally. Spencer had a severe face, but when he touched the enormous key ring on his belt, the corners of his mouth twitched in pleasure. It seemed or a signal of mercury emotion. The supervisor turned to Franklin, the boy who'd come back for a second taste of nickel, to him at Franklin. Franklin's voice cracked, and he had to fix himself before he got out. Yes, sir, you don't want to step over the line here. The supervisor looked at each boy in turn, took notes in his head, and stood. Mr. Loomis will finish processing you, he said, and walked out. The ring of his keys on his belt jingled like spurs on a sheriff in a western. He saw a young white man, Loomis, appear as minutes later and led him to the basement room where they kept the school uniforms. There are pants, gray work shirts, and brown brooks in different sizes, filled shelves on the walls. Loomis told the boys to find their sizes, directing Elwood to the colored section, which contained the more threadbare items. They had changed item, changed into their new clothes. Elwood folded his shirt and dungarees and put them into the canvas sack he brought from home. He had two sweaters in the bag and a suit from the emancipation play for church. Franklin and Bill had brought anything along with them. I would try not to stare at the marks on the other boys' bodies as they dressed. Both of them had long, lumpy lines of scars, what looked like burn marks. He never saw Franklin and Bill after that day. The school had more than 600 students. The white boys went down the hill, and the white boys went up the hill. Back in the intake room, the boys waited for their house fathers to fetch them. Elwood's arrived first, a chubby white haired man with dark skin and gray mirthful eyes. Where Spencer was severe and intimidating, Blakely's personality was soft and pleasant. He gave Elwood a warm handshake and told him that he was in charge of his assigned dormitory, Cleveland. They walked into the covered housing. Elwood's posture unscrewed. He was scared of a place that was run by men like Spencer and what that meant for his time there, to be under the eyes of a man, of men who like to make threats and relish the effects of the threats on people, perhaps, perhaps the black staff looked after their own, and even if they're just as mean as white men, Elwood had never permitted himself this kind of misbehavior that landed others in trouble. He consoled himself with the notion that he just had to keep doing what he's always done, act right. There weren't many students out and about. Figures moved in the windows of the resident, residential buildings, dinner time, Elwood supposed. The few black boys who passed them on concrete walkway greeted Blakely with respect and didn't see Elwood at all. Blakely said he worked at the school for 11 years, from the bad old days up to now. The school had philosophy, he explained, in that they put the boys' fate in their own hands. You boys are in charge of everything, Blakely said. Burn the bricks in all these buildings you see, lay the concrete, take care of all this grass. 
and do a good job too, as you will see. Work keeps the boys level. He continued, provides skills they use, they can use when they graduate. Nicholas Penny Press did all the publishing for the government of Florida, from the tax regulations to the building codes to the parking parking tickets. Learn how to execute those big orders and take your own corner of responsibility. That's knowledge you can draw on for the rest of your life. Every boy had a tent school, Berkeley said. That was a rule. Other reform reformatory schools might not strike that balance between reform and education. But Nickel made sure that their charges did not fall behind. But classroom instructions every other day, alternating with work details, Sundays off. Though House Father noticed the change in Ella's expression. Not what you expected. I was going to go to, to take college classes this year, Ella said. It was October. It would have been deep into semester. Speak to Mr. Goodhall. Goodall about it. He teaches, said Blakely, said he teaches the older students. I'm sure he can come to an arrangement, he smiled. You ever worked the field, he asked. They grew multiple corns on the 1,400 1, acres, lime, sweet potatoes, watermelon. I came up on from Blakely, said. A lot of these kids, it's their first time taking care of anything. Yes, sir, Elvis said. There's a tag or something in his shirt. He kept sticking him in the tip neck. Blakely stopped. He said, you know when they say, yes, sir, which is, you'll be okay, son. He was familiar with Elwood's situation. His intonation swaddled the word in euphemism. A lot of boys here, they got in over their heads. This is an opportunity to take stock and get your head let right. Cleveland was identical to the other dormitories, dormitories on the campus. Nickel brick under a green copper roof, surrounded by box hedges that clawed out of the red soil. Blakely took Elwood through the front door and a minute and it was swiftly clear that outside was one thing and inside was another. The warped floors creaked instantly and the yellow walls were scuffed and scratched. Stuffing dribbled from the couches and armchairs in the recreation room. Initials F in Ephesus marked the tables, gashed by a hundred mischievous hands. Elwood fix fixated on housekeeping chores Harriet would have ticked off for his intention. The fuzzy halos of finger ground around every cabinet latch and door knobs, the balls of dirt and hair in the corners. Blakely explained the layout. The first room, each door, was taken up by a small kitchen, the administration offices, and two large assembly rooms. On the second one, the dorms, two of them for the high school age students and one reserved for the younger kids. We call the younger kids Chucks, but don't ask me why, nobody knows. On the top where Blakely lived, in some each of the rooms, the boys were headed to bed. Blakely told him the dining hall was a walk and they were wrapping up supper. But did he want something from the kitchen before they closed up for the night? Ella couldn't think of food. He was too nodded up. There was an empty bed in room two. Three rows of bunks stretched over the blue line line room. Each row with ten beds, each bed with a truck at the foot for the boys' things. No one had paid Elwood any attention on the walk over when here each boy took his measures, some of them comforting quietly with their buddies as Blakely took him down the rows, and others filing away their appraisals for later. One boy looked like a 30-year-old man, but Elwood knew that was impossible since they let you out once you turn 18. Some of the boys carried themselves rough, like the white boys in the car from Tampa. But he was relieved that a lot of them looked like regular guys from his neighborhood, just sadder. If they were regular, he had to make it through. Despite what he learned, Nickel was indeed a school and not a groom jail for juveniles. Elwood had gotten off lucky, his lawyer said. Stealing a car was a big ticket offense for Nickel. He learned that most of these kids had been sent here for much less certain than the bilious and inexplicable offenses. Some students were wards of the state without family, and there was nowhere else to put them. Blakely opened the trunk to show Elwood his soap and towel, and introduced him to a boy who slept on either side of him, Dismond and Pat. The father, the house father, instructed them to show Elwood the ropes. Don't think I won't be watching you. The two boys mumbled hello and returned to their baseball cards once Blakely disappeared. Elwood had never been much of a crier, but he'd taken it up since the district and since the arrest. The tears came at night when he imagined when Nickel held the store for him. When he heard his grandmother sobbing in her room, next door, fussing around, hoping and closing things because she didn't know what to do with her hands. When he tried without success to figure out why his life had been bent to this wretched avenue, he 
he knew he couldn't let the boy see him weep, so he turned over his bunk and put a pillow over his head and listened to the voice. It was a joke and a taunt. The stories of home and dis distant cronies. The juvenile conjectures about how the world worked and the naive plans to outwit it. He started the day in his old life and ended here. Their pillowcase smelled like vinegar and at night the katydids and crickets screech and waves soft soft and loud back and forth. Bill was asleep when a different roar commended. It came from outside, a rush and a whoosh without variation, forbidding a mechanical grant to no clue to his original. He could tell which book he picked it up from, but the voice came to him, torrential. A voice across the room said, somebody's going out for ice cream, and a few voices snickered.